Okay, are we ready? Are we good? Welcome back, everybody. Uh, I just heard, I, was, I guess I was in lecture prep mode and I didn't, uh, didn't, wasn't on Piazza, but I just heard the deep note is having trouble, so I will look at that right after class. I didn't, I didn't realize, but if, uh, if you're struggling with that, I will, I don't know, I'll do my best to look at it right after class. So today uh, we are transitioning into the first uh, perception set of lectures, okay? Now, <clears throat> um, I mean, the basic setup, I guess I can do, my standard setup, is that so far we've either assumed we knew where the block was immediately, or I actually, in some of the notebooks, I had, um, had the, the system pull on the output port that was the cheat port, I call it, from the manipulation station. So if you look closely at the manipulation station, um, it tells you what you would get from the robot, which are the EWA positions and, and uh, you know, the shunk positions. It doesn't tell you directly, I mean, there's no sensors saying where the block is yet, but we have these cheat ports that will tell you the position and you know, the pose of any object in the scene. And so I was using that as a back door to sort of figure out where the brick started and plan everything relative to that, or I just hard-coded it. So today we're gonna stop using those, right? We're gonna instead use the cameras, okay? So the cameras are the sensors that we have available to see the world and to figure out where that red brick is. Um, and thus begins the conversation for perception. Okay, so I mean, <clears throat> Maybe it goes without saying, but computer vision is, is a hard. It's been hard for a long time. It's got a lot better in the last few years uh, with deep learning, okay? Um, but if you think about why it's hard and why it's, um, it breaks a lot of the optimization type approaches like we saw for kinematics, um, is because, I would say, is because if you take the picture, you know, the, the color values of, a, of the pixels in an image, this is a very bad space. So RGB, you know, the red, green, blue space, right? The, the color values in an image. Um, they don't satisfy the sort of, you know, they, the, it's hard to write um, optimization directly against the RGB values, right? So you can have very nearby RGB values that mean very different things in terms of the geometry in the world and vice versa, right? So you can, you can change the lighting a lot and the, the, the brick's still in the same scene, the RGB values went all over the place, right? So, um, so there is, because of this, I would say there are two major branches of uh, perception uh, for robotics. One of them continues to use geometry, but uses a different type of, of cameras, which gives direct geometry information. We're gonna, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about them. Um, and the other is now sort of the, the more deep learning based work, where I've separated into deep perception, typically can work directly from your RGB values and it's you know, becoming highly effective. Now, even in the last year or so, we're starting to see those two worlds collapse again and, and people are doing like NERF, if people know what NERF is, right? So, or, or deep SDF or you're seeing deep learning uh, using geometry representations and, and, and trying to combine those two again. So it's not a surprise maybe, but I'd say those two streams are, are are interesting by themselves and are gonna be hopelessly intertwined into the future. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, I, I do think though it's important. Some people say, um, you know, deep learning is all you need to do for perception right now. And I just don't think that's true. I think there has been this other parallel revolution, just as, not, maybe not quite as dramatic as the deep learning, but, but going on very much in parallel and getting spectacular results has been this geometric perception pipeline. And that's sad. Like really comically sad there, okay. Huh. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have unplugged that one. Just screwed up your stream, did I? I meant to unplug this one. Man, the number of technical problems I've managed to have.
Okay. Kind of ruined my flow, didn't it? make me register real quick. That's what I didn't do, I think. Good Lord. Use my iPhone in a second here. Okay. I'm going to lecture off my iPhone. How about that? That works fine. It should not be better than the MIT network. Okay, sorry about that. It's going to play the videos a little slower, probably. Okay, so there's a second revolution. Sorry for that. Um, based on geom geometric processing of the, uh, you know, of the visual scene. So this is, you've, you've probably seen incredible reconstructions from autonomous driving, driving through town and building like beautiful maps. This is sort of the indoor equivalent of the, the SLAM, if you know, the, the simultaneous localization and mapping. This one is called dynamic fusion. It's in particular, you know, tracking objects that can change their shape or change their pose relative, okay, but it's just absolutely stunning that a handful of years ago, um, people started be, being able to build this sort of quality reconstruction of a 3D world from a camera that you can fit in your pocket. In fact, I've got one in my pocket right here. Yeah, look at that. These kind of cameras, right? I don't always have them in my pocket, but... Uh, all that's, that's not true, actually, because um, I do always have one in my pocket. There's, a, there's one right there, too, right? Uh, which is pretty awesome. So. <clears throat> Uh, that has been fueled by a lot of different things. I mean, robotics is a good enterprise, but I would say robotics by itself might not have been enough fuel for this, but, uh, but now augmented reality, like Facebook Labs is, is working on this. They, it was originally Oculus, and, and, uh, or the, the people that did this work became Oculus, became Facebook uh, Reality Labs, right? So uh, it's being powered by those kind of revolutions. Okay, so let's just think a little bit about these different types of sensors and why are they different than a standard camera and why did they help uh, robotics jump into the perception age, I would say. Um, there's a couple different types out there. You've probably heard of LIDAR, the, the laser range finders, okay. Um, these are based on a time of flight, you know, where they're actually shooting out a, um, an active, you know, laser uh, and, and then waiting for the return and measuring the distance, okay. And some of these are just crazy good, right? So like even uh, uh, a year ago, there was these 500 meter range 
luminars coming out where a car can drive through it. It can basically see like the whole city, you know, it feels like, and it's just building highly accurate geometric models as it's just as it's driving down the street. It's, it's, um, it's crazy good. And you see these kind of, you know, this is, um, I don't know if that's actually processed or that could just be a raw, you know, return. There's some of the, the raw returns from these cameras just look spectacular. They lose, I mean, the resolution degrades the farther you go, but it's still crazy good. Okay, and when these started happening, um, you know, this, is, this started powering a lot of the geometric work in uh, robotics perception. Um, stereo image, you know, st stereo imaging is still a thing. It's an important thing, right, where you'll, you'll see stereo um, heads that were the classic approach to um, building sensors for, for perception. This is actually the Carnegie head, which is stuck in the middle of Atlas, which is the humanoid robot from at least the version of Atlas we have upstairs, um, carried around this, this stereo pair head, okay? And basically, you, you know, the basic principle, there's two cameras, right, and it's comparing the two images, trying to find similar um, images, similar blocks in the left and right image, and then saying how much, you know, how different are those blocks in the image using the distance between the, the lenses and figuring out the depth. Right, there's many different ways to do it, but, but basically a, a simple block matching stereo is a, is a perfectly good way to do it. Um, each of these have different pros and cons. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you about the ones we picked. I'll tell you most about the one we picked. Structured light, it was the Microsoft Connect came out, right? Um, this was considered uh, a major advance for indoor. LiDAR was tr traditionally considered for an outdoor applications and it works in natural light whereas the Connect was one of the first things that powered sort of the indoor perception revolution. Um, and the fact that they became so cheap because they were sold with game consoles was a big, big deal. I think that, that really opened up the number of people that were playing with them and uh, you know, just really bootstrapped the research. Okay, so the structured light approach is you're, you're projecting some image onto the scene, which allows you to then, you know, by taking a picture, have more, far more information than you would have had, uh, you know, with just uh, uh, random image, uh, random pixels coming in. But the one that we're going to use that I have in my pocket here is a is an Intel RealSense D415. Okay, this is they're pretty small, right? Pretty nice. This is actually a projected texture stereo. The RealSense line and the Intel line has a, a handful of different technologies, um, but this is the proje projected <coughs> texture stereo version. Okay. Um, so it's basically a stereo camera, except that it's doing, it's also got a little projector, obviously, that's just pushing out some pattern of light. So that if you were to look at, a, if you take stereo images of a purely white wall, then there's nothing that it could possibly do to compare those images to get a reasonable depth. Okay, but if you project an invisible pattern, an IR pattern even, on the wall, then there's still something that it can see to, in order to get per, good depth information and in general, it reduces the reliance on the textures in the world because it can, it's providing its own texture, okay? Compared to things like LiDAR and, and other time of flight technologies, one of the reasons we like this is because um, they don't interfere with each other. So that you can, you know, if, if it, this is, it actually doesn't care what the, so compared to the structured light where it's trying to set a certain pattern out, this one's just putting out any old pattern. It just wants to have texture, it doesn't care it's not trying to match a specific pattern. It's just trying to make sure that there's not sa sameness everywhere. So if you have two cameras pointing at, at the same scene and they're both projecting texture, no big deal. You st it's still getting good returns. Whereas a lot of the other cameras before that, you had to really synchronize your multiple cameras to make sure they weren't hitting, you know, sending active pulses at the same time. It was a major, major pain. Um, and we do use multiple cameras. Um, I'll show you in a minute the, the number of, of things that we a number of cameras we, we put around that dish loading example. But this is, this is new news, right? This is August 17th this year. Super sad, I, like almost, I don't really use emojis, but I almost put a sad emoji on here, right? The, you know, um, I, don't, I don't really know what I'm gonna do. You know, uh, no, but I, I, it's really bad news for the field. I mean, it, we're, we're bummed, like there's not a great replacement yet. I mean, there's more technologies out there, but the real sense has become a favorite for sure. And, um, 
I think we're, I don't know, we're just too small <laughs> as a field to, to matter, but uh, they're selling them, but I guess they're not selling enough. So I don't know what we'll be using next year in class, but we've got a bunch of real senses we're gonna hang on to them, keeping them, keep using them as long as we can. Okay, so um, we have the ability to simulate these cameras, of course, in the, in the simulation, but, we, but we, have, we simulate them in various levels of fidelity. Okay, so um, the simplest one and the one we'll use for most of the class is, um, is just a standard OpenGL renderer. Okay, so OpenGL is sort of the, the basic graphics language that's existed forever. Um, it's, it's not particularly fancy in, in the way it does um, lighting or it, uh, it's capable but not, not, um, not compared to the, you know, the new game engine quality uh, technologies but it's fast and it's got GPU acceleration and, and it's uh, definitely s s uh, um, faster than real time. Okay, so <clears throat> let me just uh, step you through. This is a, just a diagram from a very simple system that has, the, has an a single object in the scene. It turns out it's a mustard bottle. Um, okay, and uh, so we've, we've got a multi-body plant which is just holding the mustard bottle, not doing anything interesting. We've got the scene graph which is the geometry engine and we now can take an RGB sensor and add a, a new sensor into the diagram. It hooks right up to the scene graph, okay? It's just another system. It reads uh, geometry. It allows, it goes, it has a, a message passing with the uh, scene graph to get the geometry information and it spits out color image, but also um, a depth image in a couple different channels and a label image for when you want to train your machine learning algorithms, you can say per pixel what object is, is it associated with. Um, and you can have it pick, spit out the pose of the sensor, okay? So RGBD for red, green, blue, and depth sensors. It's just one more channel that gives you a depth uh, signal back. Okay, and the images that come out are the standard, you, know, the, you take the first three channels, the standard RGB images, um, you get something that looks like this out, our little mustard bottle, and then there's an image that's the same number of pixels, the same size, which just says for every pixel, what's the distance to the object in the scene, the first return, right, or NAN if it's too far. Or actually, it's not NAN, it's, there's, a, there's a particular um, integer for that. Okay, so um, this will, you'll see this come slowly into MeshCat here. Um, so in MeshCat, you can push the point clouds out to the um, renderer too. So first of all, I drew the camera with the camera coordinates here. So you can see red, green, blue, remember? Um, so X, Y, Z, right? Um, so in order to get the images that we saw, we wanted, um, we wanted the camera oriented like this. It's a little bit hard to think about. I put it at a little bit of a tilt in order to get the, um, a little bit of an angle on, on the shot, okay? Um, <clears throat> but you can go in and navigate through MeshCat. You know, you can turn on and off the geometry from scene graph and you can turn on and off the point cloud, but there's a point cloud in there giving you the same sort of, <clears throat> the, inf the raw information, I guess, from the cameras, right? Now, the camera only sees one side of the object, right? And that's a big part of what we have to take care of in perception is the fact that <clears throat> we only get partial views, right? So it's not gonna be enough to um, assume, you know, assume you can see all parts of the object and match all parts of the object. When you have occlusions, when you have multiple objects in the scene, it gets even worse, right? And uh, the best perception systems can do a lot with very partial views. Okay, I, liked, I said, um, you know, we like to just not worry about the cameras interfering, okay, but uh, this is a little ridiculous, I would say. Um, <laughs> we just didn't want to worry about whether we had enough cameras or we ever had, you know, we wanted to avoid partial views as much as possible, so we put a bunch of cameras all over the place. And we would do things like use some cameras to train the other cameras and other, there, was, there were multiple reasons for it, but, um, but we, 
we instrumented the world with, with plenty of cameras, okay, including two on the wrist, right? So right on the wrist of the, of the robot, there's two, um, two right there. We'll mount them in various places. The, um, the robot that we tried to bring in, we, we successfully brought the robot in, but the cage had to be disassembled, and the cage had, uh, the standard cage we had around it was there primarily to hold the cameras in fixed locations and have a nice view down into the scene. So we're gonna talk mostly today about relatively simple, like clean point clouds and thinking about what do you do if the point clouds are giving you pure geometry information. But next time uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna go into the fact that the real point clouds are pretty messy, okay? So I'm just introduced the, the, the idea of it here, but we're gonna dig more into it with our methods uh, next time. So this is a simulated um, depth uh, return for, for this kind of a, a scene, okay? Um, and this is what you actually get out of a real depth camera. Now you notice it's not Gaussian noise, okay? So it's not like I take every pixel and I pull a random number and I change the depth value by some Gaussian number. It's, uh, it's much more stereotypical than that. It tends to happen on the edges of objects, right? Where the normals are not very incident to the camera, okay? That's a, a typical place where you don't get good returns or don't get good depth images, or if one camera can't, or if both cameras can't see this, the side of an object or something like that. Um, there's other, so transparent or, or um, reflective surfaces, or all, there's things like this that are the canonical bad cases for these cameras. There was a, a great project actually by the same uh, Facebook group where they were mapping the inside of, of, all, uh, of homes and they wanted to build these beautiful 3D maps of, of indoor homes, right? And the problem is pe people have windows and people have mirrors. So they actually, they had a, a very clever, I'll, I'll actually talk about it later, but they have a very clever trick for figuring out how to, um, how to work with mirrors and, and uh, windows. Okay, so this is um, just an example, uh, another example of, uh, this is the D415, um, where Cooney is looking at some Legos and vegetables and random stuff on his table, okay? But if you scroll around the 3D, the same way I scrolled around the mustard bottle, he's got the camera above, the camera's not moving. This is just looking at the point cloud that's coming out from different angles. I would say, there's one word that everybody always uses when they talk about the point clouds out of D415. Lumpy. Everybody says lumpy. It's like, uh, it's, it doesn't seem like a word that would come there, but, but I've heard a lot of people say, yeah, yeah, those are lumpy point clouds. I, and, and it just has this characteristic ripple, okay? And if your carrots or whatever are like, you know, about the same size as your lumps, things get pretty dicey. Um, so that wasn't meant to be a joke. But. Okay. So um, <clears throat> that's our setup. Let's start thinking about how to do um, work with point clouds and how to go from depth, depth to point clouds and why, as you can see here, that um, point, uh, thinking about point clouds is actually a kinematics problem. So I hope it blends nicely from what we did last time. Okay. Um, So there's many representations of 3D data. Of 3D geometry, let me say. Okay. Um, the one that I was just, we were just illustrating there is called a point cloud. Okay, so typically this would be a, um, let's say a three by N matrix, okay, where this is the X, Y, Z positions. In a Cartesian frame. This, this is the number of pixels or number of points. Okay, it can also be, um, it 
can also have RGB values. You can also have normal information. There are, there are a couple other things that you can, extra information you can add to the point cloud. But the first thing we'll think about is just um, X, Y, Z positions in space that are a point that I got from a, from a indirectly from a depth camera. Okay. Um, I mean, a depth image like we got directly out of the camera, is also, in some sense, a representation of 3D geometry, but it's not enough by itself. You also need to know, let's say, the camera info. I'll get more details about that later, but in order to turn that 2D image into a 3D point cloud, you need to know something about the geometry of the, um, of the camera and potentially even the location in space. There are other representations of 3D geometry too. I mean, you can do triangular meshes. Some of you will have heard of signed distance representations. And this has led to things like NERF, which, which I will say more carefully later. Voxel grids are another one. Or occupancy grids. Okay, so for the most part, I want you to, we're gonna think about these kind of the same way we thought about rotations, where um, you know, there are many, many different types of, of representations for the geometry. There are ways to go back and forth between them. And for different algorithms or, you know, they have different virtues, right? So sometimes we'll choose to use the point cloud directly. Sometimes it's better to use the depth image or, or sine distance function, okay? The only caveat, the only place that that analogy breaks is that in the rotation representations, we could go back and forth without any loss of information. Whereas here, sometimes you have to be careful, you might actually lose information when you go across one of these boundaries, okay? But in general, I think the healthy attitude, so oftentimes people are, will be like, oh, I have a new algorithm, I just realized you could do everything in sign distance functions. And, you know, I think the people that have thought about perception a long time think, well, it's, you know, the representations are basically the same. You're not discovering something, you know, it's like, really just think about this as a library of representations you can go back and forth between. We're gonna to focus today on the point cloud representation because it plays very well with the, the kinematics of, of finding an object, finding our red brick. Here's the setup. I've got some geometry in my world. I've got some multicolored chalk. Okay. <clears throat> and let's say I've taken my camera. I'm just going to do it in 2D because I have a 2D blackboard, but um, you can generalize it to 3D easily enough. So I've got some camera, and let's just say I, I was able to see all sides of it to start. We'll, keep, we'll pretend we had a, maybe multiple cameras looking at it, and we assembled some point cloud where we got nice evenly distributed points from all over the object. Okay, so we'll call our object O and our object frame O, okay. Um, <clears throat> so we, I wanna distinguish between two sets of points, okay? We're gonna think about the, the points, well, um, we're gonna do two things. We're gonna have the points that are coming out of the camera, which we tend to call those the scene points, okay? So if I have a, um, a camera and I've taken the, my depth camera and I've projected the points into, 3D, uh, into the 3D world, then I'm gonna have a bunch of scene points And 
and they're going to come in and, in the camera frame. Okay. And our job, our task, is to try to figure out the pose of this object using the scene points that are coming in here. Now, there's many ways to do it, but we're going to start with an algorithm that, since we're working with points on this side, we're going to go ahead and represent our object. Again, we have multiple, you know, you could think of it as a, represented as a mesh or by a sine distance function or lots of different options. But our object, our known geometry that we're looking for, I'm going to go ahead and represent those, that geometry with a set of points too. And we'll call that the model points. And that's going to be represented in um, the object frame. Okay, so basically you start off, you, you know the thing you're looking for, the way you describe it is by a set of points that I ho hope to find in the world, okay? And then I'm getting uh, scene points actually measured, and my job is going to be to somehow find the relationship between these scene points and the model points, okay? Both in terms of the pose and in terms of mapping those two, um, you know, figuring out which scene point goes with which model point. Okay, so let's assume that we know this is the camera's pose in the world, right? We'll say we know that. We can measure it, we can calibrate it, okay? Our task is going to be to estimate the object's pose in the world. Right? Cameras viewing the world, giving about a bunch of depth returns. Now we're making a bunch of, we're going to make a bunch of assumptions to start, okay? We're going to assume that the only scene points that come in to our, that are in our point cloud are from the actual object, right? It's never like that, right? Normally you have your object, you have the table, you have the, you know, all these spurious points that are coming in, right? It's never that simple. But to start off, let's just assume that we have only the scene points. We'll talk about the, the how to generalize that soon. This, I guess we assume that the, these are known. These are, this, this object is known, right? So this would be finding a known object in the scene, not um, understanding some new object you've never seen before. And we're gonna make another assumption, huge assumption, but we're gonna, this one, even this lecture will get around, okay? Let's assume that we know the correspondences, okay? What do I mean by correspondence? That's an important word that's going to come up over and over again. If I have the, my canonical model, which has some number of points, my model points, if I had enough colors, I would make each of these different colors possibly. But. Okay, there's something you're doing immediately with your impressive vision system is you're realizing that these, this point goes with that point, this point goes with that point, right? You're corresponding the points based on your understanding of the object, okay? These are the correspondences. Okay, and I'm gonna just assume, even just to keep the notation, the same, that this is, I'll call this point one, point two, point three, go around, and I'll assume that these are correctly ordered so that model point I actually corresponds to scene point I. Yeah? Do you mean that by model these objects that actually match up, or that they just find a relationship that, like, so as I do, like, I've gone off of my 
Yeah, yeah. So we're, I'm starting with like they actually line up one to one matching, and we're going to quickly remove that assumption. Yeah. So it's crazy. Like that's never going to happen. Okay. Maybe I'll go over here, right? So we, given our kinematics and our frames and our understanding, right, we know that we can put everything into the world frame, right? So that um, the models, let's see, I'll do, I can take my, my model points, which are specified in object frame. There's some pose of the object but that would transform me into uh, the world frame. And similarly, I want that to match the scene points, one, one to one matching because I've assumed correspondences. Okay. And the scene points are given by this. But I can go ahead and just, you know, because this is known and this is known, I can just pre compute that and just work with this as my object. Okay, so given that, the question is, how do I reconstruct XW? XO in W. This is very much an inverse kinematics problem, right? Given the end effectors, it's very much similar to if I had my robot arm and I had my gripper desired um, end effector, I need to figure out what the, the join angles are. Okay, here I've got my points that are associated and I want to figure out what the, you know, the Q, or in this case it's represented directly as a pose of, this, um, of that object is. Now last time we didn't actually do inverse kinematics, right? We did forward kinematics then we did differential kinematics, then we did differential inverse kinematics, but we never did inverse kinematics, right? So we did Jacobians, everything. This time we're actually gonna do inverse kinematics. We're gonna actually solve this directly. You know, um, why not differential this time? Why am I not going to immediately talk about Jacobians? Yeah. There's no like real reason to do this for the meaning of R in the Jordan set, right? There's no analogous nature in like Jordan space. Right. So, so what would what would be the closest notion, right? Uh, so the the comment there was that there's not an analogous notion. I'm saying for the. Uh, Right, that there's not an analogous notion of like the joint measurements, for instance, in the um, in the camera space, right? But <clears throat> I mean, if I had a current pose, I could ask, what is an incremental change in my model points versus relative to you know, if I if I were to make an incremental change in in this pose, how do my scene points change? Right there, I could still ask the differential question. So I think the the it's, it's possible we could still do differential kinematics. And in fact, we will do differential kinematics for perception when we want to do things like tracking objects. But unfortunately, we have to solve a harder problem for perception to start, okay? Because the, you know, the, the EWA, we always give, have joint measurements that tell me what position I'm in right now. And I can ask, given I'm in this position, what's an increment gonna do? In the um, perception problem, I, the robot has to wake up at some point and for the first time look at a bunch of points and solve the harder problem of figuring out where am I at all, right? There's no, I can't do an incremental change until I have something to start from, right? So I have to solve this sort of more global problem first in order to, to start this. Did I say that well enough? You guys are, didn't look like 
totally with me on that. I don't have, basically, I don't have an initial guess for the, for the pose. If I had an initial guess, I could say, if I change that initial guess a little bit, then how would it change, right? I don't, but I don't have like a, a close initial guess that such that local ch changes of it um, are gonna get me where I need to be. Yeah? Is it still my version of the problem where it's much harder to get it to the center version that it is possible to make that change? Um, the question is, so why is this version of the problem harder? Why do I say this is the, the, the global problem which is harder? So um, the short answer is that, uh, you know, basically the differential problem is that, it, you know, you're solving, locally you're solving a bunch of linear equations all the time and we can write, we, we did write convex problems in order to track it. So our, our quadratic programming approach to inverse, differential inverse kinematics was an excellent solution. When you don't have that initial guess, then you have to solve the harder problem where that might have multiple local minima and um, in general, you have to find the needle in the haystack, right? It's not about tracking something that you've already found, it's about finding it for the first time. And because there are, there are lots of different, uh, we're gonna see when we write the equations down why the, there are local minima that come up, okay? But, but it, um, you might think, um, you know, that clump of points over here is my brick. No, that could be that point. You know, there could be something very different that would be close matches to your points. So it's a harder problem. Uh, it does translate all the way down to computational complexity, but, um, but that's not the simplest way to see it. Yeah. Okay, so let's think about this, um, this problem here. Like, I want you to see this as basically a linear uh, problem, right? So why is that a linear problem? So I can write x, w, o, o, m, i equals d, s, i. This is given, given, right, we have to solve for this, okay? You can write this as p, o, w plus r, o, w, p, o, m, i, okay? where this is the position of, that, of the frame and this is the rotation of that frame, okay? Um, and in particular, if we now choose three by three rotation matrices as our representation of this, then this equation is actually a matrix equation. I'm not just hiding behind spatial algebra to make that true. This is actually a matrix, a three by three matrix times a three by three, three by one vector, okay? And this equation should try to, should match. So I can write this, this being multiplied like this in, in you know, these, this structure, when I see that, I think the problem I'm trying to solve is linear in my parameters, my decision parameters, right? So I hope you see this as being AX, you know, maybe we'll do approximately equal to B. But you have to be a little careful because, you know, what's in X? What are the things I'm trying to solve for? In order to write this out, right, you have to shuffle and flip and reorient, right, because X is actually holding inside it PWO and RWO rolled out into a long vector, okay? A actually has what does it have? It has this hiding inside A plus a bunch of ones, okay, to get that term. Okay, and B is that term. Okay, but if I see this, I see a linear uh, set of equations. Okay, now because, as Alex points out, it's ridiculous to assume that you have exactly overlap all the time, um, 
asking that to be exactly equal for a whole bunch of points from a sensor that we know is going to be a little bit noisy. We know it's not going to match all the points. It's, it's too much to say, you know, here's a bunch of uh, equations, make that equality hold. So just like last time, we're going to write the softer version of this as, a, as an optimization problem. Right? So what I'd like to do instead is, you know, roughly this. I'll see you in just a second. I'll even just, I can call my decision variables whatever I like here. So P, R, P plus R. Ah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to that in a second, yeah. Okay, so, so we're, we're close to this, okay? This is the direct translation from this. Now, Alex made a, an excellent point, which I should have repeated, which is that uh, there's something wrong with the, the formulation that I've written here. If I search over all P's and all R's, then there's nothing guaranteeing that I will get a rotation matrix out. If I've chosen a three by three rotation matrices, then I need something else to guarantee that I'm going to actually get a rotation matrix out, right? Um, so the conditions uh, to make the rotation matrix are additional constraints, just like we added in the uh, QP formulation for, uh, for the kinematics. Uh, <clears throat> you can write it a bunch of different ways, but roughly you need R to be orthonormal, okay? And you need the determinant of R to be positive one. This is uh, equivalent to saying that R is, um, R transpose is R inverse. Okay, but we'll use this form of it. Okay, those are the constraints that will guarantee that if we solve this optimization problem subject to those constraints, then, um, then we'll get a good rotation matrix. Now this, because of this AX minus B, this is a nice quadratic objective in the sense that it's convex. We'll just say convex. What is this? The decision variables are the elements of R, okay? So this is actually nine constraints that I've written in this matrix form, where the, all the elements of this thing have to equal the elements of this thing, okay? And each of those nine constraints is quadratic in the elements of R. I get R1 times R1, you know, plus whatever, okay? So this is quite nine quadratic equality constraints. And then this one is actually worse. Anybody know how, how, what the determinant of three by three matrix R's are? What degree, how, how, you know, how the coefficients of R enter that? You can look up your de determinant formula and you can, you know, the three by three determinant is just a, a sum of two by two determinants or whatever, multi you know, multiply, but this is basically cubic in coefficients of R. Okay, so this one's beautiful, this up here, beautiful. As you know, with my optimization hat on, this is beautiful. This one's like, eh. Don't love that, but we can, we can maybe deal with that. I know a bit about how to do quadratic equality constraints. Cubic, uh, I hate that one, okay? So here's what, um, here's what most people do, is we're just gonna let's pretend that one's not there and we'll deal with it later, okay? Um, because it really does make the optimization hard. That's an ugly nonlinear constraint. 
the cubic one. Fortunately, if this is true, if we satisfy this, then the determinant can actually only be plus or minus one. So basically we'll solve it. We'll check if the determinant is plus or minus one. If it was minus one, we'll make our correction and resolve. Okay, and that works out. Because solving for that, writing that constraint directly is, is gross. Okay, so a couple questions just to make sure you're, you're following with me. So um, if I have 10 points from my object, how many decision variables do I have? So MI and SI are, there's, there's 10 points. Right, right. The number of decision um, variables does not change with the number of points. I've got three by three matrix here and three, vector, uh, three by one vector here. All that I'm doing, if I have more variables, I've just changed my objective function. I have more terms in this, they sum up, okay? But I still only have nine decision variables. The number of decision variables does not depend on the number of points in the scene, okay? Okay, so even this problem, um, you know, the quadratically constrained um, quadratic objective, that's not a great problem, okay? In general, um, we would have to re relax it to do nice work with it. It turns out that this particular problem has a beautiful solution, okay? The, the closed form solution given the, given the singular value decomposition. It's kind of one of those quirks where like, uh, you know, there's a th bunch of sets of things we know how to solve beautifully with optimization. There's a bunch of things we can solve a bunch of different ways. They're all the same set. And then there's like SVD, which solves these weird problems <laughs> that, that I, I don't know totally how to connect. Um, this problem we, we are gonna have a good solution for, okay? But I want you to have a little bit of geometric, you know, the same way I tried to draw the QPs last time. I'm gonna try to draw this, uh, this optimization problem for you so you can sort of have some intuition about what's happening. To do that, let me draw it. Let me, let's do it in 2D real quick, okay? I hope it'll also help you work through the mechanics, okay? So in 2D, remember our rotation matrices are now two by two matrices. We know that they always have the, the canonical form, right? The um, cosine theta, negative sine theta, sine theta, Cos theta, that's just background knowledge, okay? But I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna use theta um, as my decision variables. We'll that would be a, if I, if I tried to search over thetas, then I would have this nonlinear dependence through cosine and sine of that, and that would be a harder optimization, okay? I, would, I wanna leverage the fact that this was a linear, op a linear um, term here, which turned into a, quadri a quadratic objective, but so I have to use the coefficients of our not theta, you know, I can't make the coefficients of our nonlinearly depend on my decisions, okay? So I could just do A, B, C, D as my parameterization. In general, in the three by three case, that is roughly what you do. You would fill out the whole three by three matrix, okay? But in this case, in two by two, it's, everything's better in 2D, okay? In 2D, um, you know if you have an orthonormal matrix, then you have to have this relationship where I can say, um, I know that's gonna be true, right? In order for, the, old, the orthonormal vector, there is exactly one orthonormal vector, you know, for this, and it's, it's that, okay? So this is my, gonna be my parameterization. Let's assume that the position is zero or known, just so I can plot the, I make a graph over, uh, I'm gonna basically plot 
A and B, and then I want to plot my objectives and my constraints on top of that, okay? Okay, so the objective we said is going to be quadratic in the coefficients of A and B, right? So A and B, when I multiply things through here, each term here is going to be linear until I square it. Okay, so what's that going to look like as a function of A and B? It's, a, it's, it's going to be a positive quadratic because it's this nice squared form. It's going to look like a nice bowl somewhere in my state space, or in my, just my, um, my variable space here. Right, so I expect that to look like some bowl just like I had last time, right? Now what do the constraints look like, right? If I have R, R transpose equals I, right? That's equivalent, if I write this out, what is that gonna be? So that's gonna give me two constraints two different constraint. I get a squared plus b squared has to equal one. That's this, this guy here. a squared plus b squared equals one. And the off diagonal, oops, the off diagonal says that a b minus b a equals zero. That one's vacuously true, so we don't even need to include it in our <coughs> optimization. It happens that saying the determinant of R equals plus one in 2D, it's just this quadratic again and it's, it gives me the same constraint. So I can, I've already, I've already got that one covered. I'm guaranteed to have a determinant of plus one because I did this trick, right? If I had independently parameterized those, I would need to have this constraint. When you have a determinant that's minus one, that gives you this, these um, roto rotations, they're called, okay? So that would be like my vector, you know, being flipped, doing a rotation and a flip, right? And so by parameterizing this, this is like um, A, B, this is, if you think about it, is um, A negative B, or negative B, A. Right, this is, that's what I've done here is parameterize those this way. So that's only gonna give me positive rotations. The rotor rotation would have been down here, okay. I hope I'm not, I hope I'm saying that well enough to be useful. <clears throat> Good, okay, so we have a quadratic objective over B and A, and we have a constraint, which is a quadratic constraint, A squared plus B squared equals one. So that's gonna be the circle, the unit circle on here. Now remember that the number of points, that's true no matter how many scene points I, I put in. Okay, so I can make a problem, a real problem in 2D and have lots of scene points and just build up this, this different quadratic uh, objective and quadratic constraint, okay? And that's what I've done here. Okay, so I've got a real object that I cast some scene points from, okay? And I can turn the object, so I move the data points, okay? That's, I've got theta parameterizing my turn, that's just for my GUI, really, to change the, the problem data. And the quadratic form, in order to you know, minimize that objective, is moving around, okay? The cool thing is, it wants to be, you see the, can you see what's happening here? I'm just, I hope I can do this without redefining anything, yeah. There we go. You see what's happening there? That's the, that disk is the unit circle constraint just projected up, okay? The minimum of that quadratic form it wants to be at the, you know, have, of course, because in order to make those points match through a rotation, right, 
it's going to find a rotation that is, in order to make those points match, it's going to find an actual rotation. Right? It's not going to try to shrink anything. It's not going to try to expand anything. So in the noise-free case, it's beautiful and good. You know, if I rotate the object, then I get a different quadratic form that moves around, okay? And that constraint actually doesn't have to do any work. Now, as soon as you have noise, or you have bad correspondences, or anything like that, then what's going to happen is the objective, in order to match my data, the objective is going to get more complicated, and it could move away from the unit circle, okay? And that constraint's going to pull me back. Now, we're going to come back to that later when we think about, you know, a convex relaxation. Oh, that's cool. Didn't mean to do that. Um, new trick. Uh, so, so in general, we might eventually relax the unit circle constraint to the unit disk. Okay, so it's easier to write an optimization problem that says I'm anywhere inside of the circle, not just on the boundary of the circle. The, not, the boundary of a circle is a non-convex set, but it can, I can say I'm inside a circle, including the interior. Okay, and then you're going to see, we're going to see things like the, uh, you know, the optimization is tight. It will give me the right answer if the quadratic form is pulling me outside. But it, when it goes inside, I start getting some, uh, some errors. Okay, and that's going to be, even in the most advanced, like, SDP relaxations, sorry, the semi-definite programming relaxations of point cloud registration that you'll read in papers, you know, these years, you know, that are still coming out. You're going to see them saying, oh, it's tight often, but there's some cases where it's not tight. It's, it's exactly this picture. It's when it's sliding inside, it, it's not. Okay. Changing the number of points will change the shape of my quadratic bowl, but it doesn't move that constraint, okay? And in the noise-free case, it's not going to move the minimum. So that's the picture I want you to have in your head. Okay, let's make sure you're, you're fully with me here. So um, here's a couple immediate things that come to mind. My box is symmetric, right? It has rotational symmetry, especially, I mean, even if, if it's a, a rectangle, it's got some symmetry. If it's a cube, it's got lots of symmetry, right? So. Um, how do symmetries affect the algorithm? How would they change that picture? If my object was suddenly symmetric or even circular or something, what would, what would, how would that change that picture? What's that? It would have, it, like, what would it have to do to that picture, right? The quadrat, the, the objective is quadratic. So it can't, like, go up and then go back down. Yeah. So it's going across both places, right? Yeah. So this is all the right stuff to think about. Okay, but it, it, it can never happen in this case because we assumed correspondences. So there is no, there's no such thing as symmetry because even if I draw a point that looks like this, right, the fact that I had a magic correspondence function, even if I were to rotate this, it would correspond to, you know, I've already broken the symmetry by choosing, by assigning a correspondence. Okay, so the pictures you have in your head about symmetries in the correspondence case um, are wrong. Uh, it, um, that sounded mean. Um, we're going to solve the correspondence problem in a second, okay? But when you think of that picture, I, w I would immediately think, okay, how does it handle the symmetries case? And you don't have to handle the symmetries case. It does not handle the symmetries case. Another fun one, we, I won't belabor it, but you think about what's the minimum number of points that you need for this problem to have a unique solution, 
right? It's almost what you think, but it might, have, it might, it might be a little bit more or less than you think, okay? You can do it by just counting the number of decision variables and counting the number of constraints, right? If you assume that the points are unique, so they don't, I mean, if the points landed on top of each other, that would be a degenerate case. But if you assume the points are unique, then you can just play a counting game and figure out how many um, parameters you need. And it would be, it'll give you a slightly different answer if you use this clever parameterization in 2D versus the four parameters, okay? But it's all good. You can completely understand this. Okay, but let's let's dig into this a little bit more. So this correspondence function was just you know too big of an assumption, right? But that's what made our optimization magically good. Like the fact that you can solve that, in fact, in a closed form with well, with a singular a call to the singular value decomposition, which is as close as you get numerically, I guess, to a closed form solution. Um, that's amazing. So let's lean on it and come up with an algorithm that solves for the correspondences and the poses simultaneously. Okay. The case that we're, we're going to use to, to think about it is imagine that you've gotten yourself close to the right answer, okay? So I've got my real object and I've got my measured object, okay? Let's say I'm sort of close, okay? Then a reasonable heuristic would be to basically assign the um, correspondences based on what's close to me, right? The true correspondence is this. But let's just examine as a heuristic, given my current guess, this goes back to the differential IK case, so let's think about it in a sort of in a differential way, okay, where I've got an initial guess and I want to improve it. So what if I use as a heuristic, let me pretend that my correspondences are whichever point I find on the other one that is closest in a Euclidean sense and maybe the mapping might not be unique, right? It could be that I map multiple points to the same, multiple model points to the same scene point or vice versa. Typically you pick one because you search through, um, you search through either your model points and find the closest scene point or vice versa, okay? All right, so let's say we just assign the correspondences that way based on the closest points. What would that look like in our optimization? Well, in this, we need a little slightly refined notation here. If I write, um, let me call it CJ or CI for correspondence I equals J, okay? So this would say model point I corresponds to scene point J. that I can write that my thing that I'm searching for here, model, I'm gonna just use this CI here, minus P W S um, I squared as my objective. This is just the Euclidean distance Right? So for each, C, if for, for each of these um, model points, I can just look through this. I can just try all of my possible correspondences and find the closest point. That would be something like saying that CI is like an argmin over J of mj, okay? So just look through the points, find the closest one, and write it into ci. Okay, this is a closest point. Okay. 
Now I don't need any constraints here because in this case, now this is the decision variable and this is fixed. Right, so that's, that's not, I don't have to worry about that not being a rotation matrix, that's just fixed, it's a constant. Okay, the iterative closest point algorithm, one of the um, most famous algorithms in point registration is just this. It's called ICP, okay? It just says, take, my initial, take an initial guess of my pose, solve this problem, Okay, find the correspondences, then solve that problem, then solve this problem, then solve that problem, okay, and iterate until convergence. Convergence is simple. It's an integer-based convergence, right? If my, once my correspondences don't change, because that solves the global optimality, if the correspondences don't change, then that one's not gonna do any work. So it, you have a complete, it's not like a floating point convergence, it's like a, Iteration, it's are done. No more work to do. Convergence. Yes? Uh, is it guaranteed to always converge? It is certainly not guaranteed to always converge to the right solution. There are local minima. You can find yourself, um, you can find yourself, you know, attached, uh, corresponding to the wrong points and unable to get out. It should always converge, I think. I can't imagine a case where is there a way it would oscillate? It's a, it's a good question. I, I don't know for sure, but it's, I think the most important point is it won't necessarily converge to the right solution, right? So you can certainly get yourself into, into traps. Okay, this is a real algorithm. Um, people use it all the time, okay? Uh, no, not this, right? Okay, this is... Um, one step of the algorithm would be, you know, just find the closest points. I have a, sorry, a shaded blue object and the other object being the transformed object in the pink. Just find the closest point. And if you're, this is with known correspondences, I guess, then the match is correct and it solves the global uh, optimization. And I made a bunch of cutesy animations. Oh, that's not mine. This is the Stanford bunny, but that's the classic iterative closest point graphic you can find all over the place, okay? So there's a lot of points there, right? People, you can do this at scale. I forgot to stick in my cutesy graphics, shoot. Um, okay, but you can do this at scale. In order to scale it up, that problem, again, doesn't get bigger the objective gets, there's more terms in the objective, but the decision variables doesn't change. So that scale's fine, okay? This one, the only thing you wanna do is make that closest point query faster. So you use clever data structures to, to store your, to, to make that closest point query faster. In particular, you know, we'll use FLAN, which is a fast nearest neighbor algorithm, um, okay? In order to make that work. But, it, but once you do that, it scales to big problems. And it's practically useful. So um, this is a close-up view of the wrist camera of the dish loading robot when it's picking up a mug, okay? Now, why do you think, right here, it stops, it does, you see that little chick, 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 and then it goes? What do you think's happening there? So it's got a, deep perception system, finding mugs, doing planning, gets all close. But before it picks anything up, it takes a nice shot with the wrist-mounted camera, and it does some ICP registration to align the point clouds right in the hand frame, kick, 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 in order to grab, okay? So for, um, you know, for real applications, if you will, I mean, almost real applications, right? Then, um, you know, this is actually a very good algorithm for especially when you are close to a good solution and you want to refine it, okay? In, t in general, the deep perception approaches are gonna do better at the global problem of like, I've got, I don't know where it is in the scene, but for the local problems, the geom geometric often are still state of the art.
And I should say, um, it's a couple things to note about that application, right? So um, you have to be careful. Like, why don't you just get right close to picking the mug up when you do that, right? So as you get closer to the geometry, the depth cameras have a, have a minimum throw, a minimum range, right? So if you get too close, things start disappearing from your point cloud. It's kind of frustrating. You don't think, oh, it's the perfect place for a camera. I'll put it in my hand. And then it's like, you can't see anything because you've got a yeah, minimum range, OK? Um, so there's some sweet spot where you get just, depending on which camera you've mounted on your hand, you get to a certain distance, you do your, take your best possible point cloud, boom, and off you go. But even when we use, we still use these kind of algorithms even for our um, a deep learning pipeline. So this is um, an early version of a, of a tool that has gotten very mature in, very, in many labs nowadays, um, <clears throat> where in order to train a deep learning system, which we will, we will do, um, we, we have some CAD models, we have some raw perception data, like we took our, our drill and put it in the, the space, and we just wanna come up with ground truth labels of real world data. We have a human give our initial guess. So the human says, it's around here, 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 three clicks, and then that's a good enough initial guess that our ICP can go in and do the rest of the work. We label the image as, as saying that, you know I know that I have pixels there that correspond to the drill, right? And then I can back out actually all of the different frames that I took now know exactly where the drill is. And you can label with a few clicks from the human, you can give a huge training set to a deep network. Okay. So it really is, even though it's our starter algorithm, it really is a, a, still a useful algorithm. Let me just end by pointing out a couple things um, for today. We're going to talk more about the noisy case. Um, soon, but let me just, I think we, right here on the board, we already have a couple examples that would, would show some of its limitations, okay? One of those limitations is this extreme sensitivity to outliers, okay? If I happen to have like a beautiful point cloud around my measured object, and then like, I don't know, two extra points way over here, right? Then in my quadratic form, right, I'm gonna, um, well, sorry, the, the original thing, is, so if, if it never corresponds to that, you're fine. But if you get to the point where, you know, this thing is pulling you in the wrong direction, okay, then you can have um, what looks like a pretty good point cloud, have like one point pulling me in the wrong direction, totally skew my objective and, and compromise my results, okay? So there is a sensitivity of the outliers. As soon as you get inside where your argmin is only matching the real object, then things tend to be fairly okay. But if your closest point captures some outlier, then things get bad. Um, and especially because the cost of the outliers, you know, the, the cost you penalize basically by the length of these rubber bands, <laughs> roughly. So the bigger the rubber band, the bigger the relative contribution of a single point. Okay, um, and we'll, we'll talk about some of the other um, you know, what, what happens in the noisy case and how you can make it more robust uh, next time too. But let me just say that this one, if we ask the question again, what happens on a rotationally symmetric ob object? Right? This time, it's gonna be exactly what we were saying before. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, I mean, this SVD formulation is beautiful in L2. It's harder in L1. Um, I think what people end up doing, um, the question was why not use, change this to an L1 objective so it's less sensitive to, um, to outliers. Um, so if you just did the absolute value, for instance. Um, <clears throat> so, so it makes the optimization problem a little bit harder. What people tend to do is a, a truncated least squares. So you can solve that as a, and there's various approaches to, to solving for that. Or, um, or you even in your closest point algorithm try to re explicitly reject outliers. Also, we'll, we'll talk about ransack as another, uh, there's a couple different approaches, but normally it's stick with that. It's a, it's a workhorse and do what you need to to clean it up before you hand it to that. <laughs> okay. Think about how the iterative closest point algorithm works now um, you know, for a rotationally symmetric. Right, if I'm off by 90 degrees or 180 degrees, it's gonna find matches. They're gonna be the wrong matches, okay? But it'll lock itself in and it'll be stuck. 
So if, that's, if you don't care, if you don't mind rotational symmetry in your answer, that's fine. But if you want, we're looking for a canonical pose, ICP won't give it to you. Cool, okay, so perception, parts of perception are just kinematics. And, uh, and this is our first version of the algorithm. We'll get more fancy with it in the next couple lectures. Uh, I will go look at deep note right now as soon as the questions are done.